Hey everyone, konnichiwa. Nikki Young here, back with my true crime podcast series, Serial Napper. Now you likely haven't heard of tonight's case, and after you do hear it, I think you're going to wonder why. It has all of the same elements as other famous serial killer couples like Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka, as well as Ian Brady and Myra Hinley. Absolutely shitty human beings that got off on raping and murdering people. It's a case where you kind of have to wonder to yourself, if these two people never met, would these rapes and murders have happened? You be the judge. I will forewarn you, this is not an easy story to listen to, but it's one that I think needs to be told. Tonight, we're taking the podcast to France as we talk about the serial killer couple Michel Fournier and Monique Olivier. Before we jump into it, let's talk about tonight's sponsor, who is actually kind of linked to this case through a dream that she had. Sandra Hilliard is a professional in the field of remote viewing, and she's back sponsoring tonight's case. Sandra actually recommended this case to me, so thank you so much, Sandra. Now, if you don't know what remote viewing is, listen up. It's absolutely fascinating. You've heard of sketch artists, right? Those who speak to a witness and then make a sketch based upon the witness's description? Well, remote viewing comes in handy when there are no witnesses to interview. A person can use their psychic ability to sketch and describe places, people, things that are related to a case that they've never actually seen before. You might be a skeptic, but this is a legitimate process that aids in real life cases. If you thought you might have a little bit of psychic ability or you'd like to nurture your psychic ability, Sandra is starting another free introductory course on Saturday, October 17th. Now is your opportunity to see if this could be a fit for you. Head on over to Sandra's website for more details. That's www.sandrahillier.com. I also have the link in my show notes. Stay tuned because halfway through the episode, I'm going to tell you about that dream that Sandra had that relates to this case. Now, like I said, this case is not for the weak-hearted. It's a tough one to listen to, but it's important to get the story out there because the boogeyman isn't always what you might think. It might be a man lurking in the dark, or it really could be a man lurking behind his pregnant wife. Let's get into it. Michel Fournier, you've probably never heard of this man before, but he was an absolutely evil man, dubbed the Ogre of Ardennes due to his brutal crimes. And I think it's important to remember that as we begin with his early years. Michel was born on April 4th, 1942 in Sedan, which is in France and quite close to the Belgium border. You'll see that he would later use this proximity to the border as an advantage. Anyway, he grew up in a mid-class, hard-working family. His father was a metal worker and worked really long hours, and it's also said that he was an alcoholic. His mother was a stay-at-home mom, but grew up as a farmer's daughter, so she also understood the meaning of hard work. In later years, his father would go on to divorce his mother and take full custody of the children, which was highly unusual for the times. Michelle had a sister and a brother who were both older than him. As a child, Michelle was quiet and honestly just quite average. Some of his classmates said that he liked to steal pointless things in school like pencils and erasers. Honestly, pretty harmless behavior overall. He enjoyed chess and classical music. He would later go on to say that he was in fact molested by his mother as a child, but from everything I have researched, it appears that most professionals don't actually believe him. While it is common for a man who would go on to do the things that he did to have been molested as a child, he never spoke about it until he was arrested for his crimes. And for a female to abuse their son, it's very rare. While it's not impossible, it seems that this was most likely a lie, but I guess we'll never really know. Here's kind of an odd story that Michelle would later identify as a memorable point in his life. Apparently, he was really disturbed at the sight of his sister defecating in a bucket. They obviously didn't have indoor plumbing, um, but it, it really bothered him. He would go on to say, To me, a woman doesn't defecate. It is degrading. It does not live up to the image of the Blessed Virgin. Yeah. Apparently women don't poop. I don't know. And thus began his fascination with virgins. 
He sees virgins as incredibly desirable, whereas anyone else just isn't. This would play a big role in his young adulthood and the crimes he would go on to commit. Now, there isn't a whole lot of information about Michelle from his childhood until he would go on to start committing his crimes, but I'm going to do the best that I can to fill in all of the details for you. Michelle, at one point in his life, served in the Air Force, and then he became a mill worker and a carpenter. He married his first wife in 1964. He also said he became obsessed with the concept of virginity after he married his first wife and learned that she, unlike him, was not a virgin. Michel was deeply disturbed when he learned that his wife had been with other men, and he alleges this discovery caused him to become fixated on the idea of having sex with virgins. Together, they had their first child, but it wasn't long before he would act out on his fantasies about virgins. Now, who are most commonly virgins? Minors, of course, and so he focused his efforts on minors. In 1967, he was arrested for the first time for assaulting a minor. I couldn't find a whole lot of detail about what happened here, but that's likely because the victim was a minor, and so they're usually protected from being named in the media. After his first arrest, his first wife was smart and filed for divorce. In 1970, Michelle remarried and had three more children, a son, and then twins. If he thought that having all of these children would mean that he would be more sensitive to crimes against children, you were mistaken. Between 1966 and 1973, he was sentenced for acts of voyeurism and violence against minors. He was incarcerated on March 25, 1984 for a dozen assaults and rapes on minors in the Paris region, and he was sentenced to seven years in prison. In the meantime, his second wife was also smart and filed for divorce. Now, it was during this incarceration where he would go on to meet his third wife, Monique Olivier. Monique would become a partner to his future crimes, seemingly taking as much pleasure in them as Michelle. Let's take a minute to talk about their so very romantic love story. Michelle had learned that he needed to change his strategy. I mean, he was caught and found guilty for sexual acts against minors, so he had to change what he was doing in order to not get caught in the future. He had no plans to change or stop his behavior. He just knew that he didn't want to get caught and end up going to prison again. So he decided that he needed a female partner in crime, someone that would help him to find these young virgins. So Michelle puts out an ad in the newspaper. Honestly, I had no idea that prisoners could take out ads in newspapers, but apparently they could back then in France. The newspaper ad read, Prisoner would like to correspond with anyone of any age to forget loneliness. And wouldn't you know it, Monique Olivier saw the ad and responded, In fact, Monique had a fascination with males in prison. She was actually married to a man currently in prison, though separated, but I guess she was getting kind of bored of him and was excited at the prospect of chatting with someone new. She wrote Michelle a letter and the pair quickly began corresponding back and forth. Monique was fully aware of his past crimes and they actually began to talk about the things that they would do together when Michelle would be released. They made a pact. Monique would help Michel with his desire to find virgins, and in turn, Michel would arrange to have Monique's husband killed. Monique hated her abusive husband and would do just about anything to get rid of him. I always think it's quite interesting that there are women out there who are enticed by men in jail. Is it low self-esteem? Is it the feeling of potentially being in danger? Well, with Monique, it seemed to be something else. She could have dated and married someone else in prison, but she picked Michelle, knowing of his past crimes against young women, and also knowing that he wanted to re-offend, and actually wanted her help. When Michelle gets out of prison in 1987, the pair quickly get married and move to a village in Burgundy, France. In December 1987, just two months after Michelle's release, the couple would work together to find their first victim. 17-year-old schoolgirl Isabelle Levy 
was walking home from school when a vehicle pulled up beside her. It was Monique, who stopped to ask the girl for directions. Monique would later say she had selected her because she looked like a younger version of herself, and Michelle wanted to imagine that he was deflowering her. Those are her words, not mine. I hate the word deflowering. Michelle was driving in another car, so he wasn't immediately seen by Isabel. Most of us are taught that women are generally safe, so Isabel had no idea that her life was in danger when she agreed to get in the car to help Monique find the location she was looking for. Driving down the road, Monique reached the spot where Michelle was standing with his car, pretending that it had broken down. Monique, as planned, stopped the car and pretended to offer him a lift. Once inside the vehicle, Michelle choked Isabel with a piece of rope before sedating her with Rohypnol. The couple brought the girl to their home, where Michelle raped and strangled her. Afterwards, her body was thrown down a well. Both Michelle and Monique took great pleasure in their first rape and murder, and would actually act out the scene again and again in their bedroom during sex, with Monique pretending to be Isabel. I told you guys, this couple is truly sick and twisted. This is not a case of a woman who was mentally or physically abused and going along with her husband's crimes. Monique was an active participant who got off on the whole thing. Sadly, Isabel's skeletal remains would not be found until July of 2006. Her parents and family would not have any answers as to her whereabouts for 19 years, and Michelle and Monique would fly under the radar as there were other similar suspects at large that police believed were responsible for her disappearance. Now, the story of their next victim is kind of an interesting one, and it was more of a situation where they had some loose ends that they needed to tie up. So during his incarceration in the 1980s, Michel shared a cell with Jean-Pierre Halagouarche, a member of a bank robber gang. Jean-Pierre made the mistake of telling Michel that he'd hidden a large cache of money and gold from one of his robberies in a forest. Michel and Monique needed money, so they made an alliance with Jean-Pierre's wife, Farida. They thought that Farida might know where the money was stashed and agreed to split it if they were able to find the cash. In reality, Farida was nothing but a pawn. She wasn't an equal partner in this. She was just a means to an end for the couple to get money. The three of them head to this forest to look for the money and they actually find it. But because it was stolen loot, it took a little bit of time for Michelle to find a way to basically clean the money. But once they do, they walk away with about a million dollars. Michelle still has Farida's share of the money at the time, so they plan to meet with her and give her the cash. Well, that's what she thinks. She thinks she's going to be getting her fair share, but Michelle and Monique have other plans. Farida gets into the back seat of their car with Michelle when he takes out a shoelace and begins to strangle Farida with it. Then, a knife falls out of his pocket, and Monique picks it up and hands it to Michelle, and he stabs Farida to death. They leave her body in the forest, and to this day, it's never actually been found. Now, Monique and Michelle have this $1 million, so they decide to buy a house out in the middle of nowhere. It was actually a castle. Yeah, like a legit real-life castle on a 32-acre property. But more importantly, it was so isolated that you wouldn't be able to hear anyone screaming from the inside. It was the perfect place to carry out his plans of finding virgins to abduct, rape, and murder behind the walls of his castle. Sandra Hilliard, a professional in the field of remote viewing, is back sponsoring tonight's case. You guys, this is the case that actually got her started with remote viewing. Listen to this. She had a dream, and in the dream, she was told she was going to the house of a serial killer. She told her then-husband about the very strange dream, joking that she must have been watching too much CSI on TV. Well, two weeks later, a serial killer was arrested, and they showed the house on TV. 
Sandra was shocked to see that it was the same house that was in her dream. Crazy, right? This was Michelle's castle that she had dreamed about. If you thought that you might have a little bit of psychic ability or you're looking to nurture your psychic ability for the greater good, Sandra is starting another free introductory course. It starts on Saturday, October 17th, and you can do it all online. So now is your opportunity to see if remote viewing could be a great fit for you. Head on over to Sandra's website for more details. That's www.sandrahillier.com. And I also have the link in my show notes. So just click on over and check it out. It's such a cool skill to develop and you can actually solve real life mysteries. Now back to the story. In 1988, Monique becomes pregnant with Michelle's baby and decides to use this to her advantage. When she meets their next victim, she's eight months pregnant, so she's big. And one might think that carrying a child in your belly might make you a little, I don't know, sensitive to killing people, but not with Monique. So a heavily pregnant Monique approaches Fabienne Leroy, a 20-year-old student in a supermarket, telling her that she urgently needs to get to a doctor and asks if she could accompany her. Again, most people would not feel afraid or intimidated by a pregnant woman, so Fabienne got into the car. Of course, she thought she was doing a good deed. Michelle was crouched in the back seat, ready to subdue her the moment she got in the car. They drive to a field and pull Fabienne out of the car at gunpoint. Now, at this point, he has Monique check her private area to ensure she's a virgin. Because remember, Michelle is obsessed with virgins. Then, Michelle rapes her and shoots her and discards her body like a piece of trash in a field. He basically just takes what he wants and then discards his victims. He has no remorse, and Monique is right there along with him. A few months later, Monique gives birth to their son, Salim. And while they appear to be a normal, happy little family, Michelle's thirst for virgins does not diminish. So, while on a train, he begins chatting to Jeanne-Marie Desramaux, a 22-year-old French student. He talks about his new family, he talks about his son and his wife. Again, he didn't appear to be a threat, and Jean-Marie had no idea of the danger that she was in. He offers her a lift home and says that perhaps she could earn a little bit of cash by babysitting for him. When they get to the train station, Monique is waiting for him in the parking lot by the car. So, of course, when Jean-Marie sees a woman at the car, his story checks out. He's clearly married with a baby. She chats with the couple for a bit about the possibility of babysitting for them. She declines a ride home as she says she has friends waiting for her, but she does agree to a meeting at their home the following day so that she could meet their son and they could discuss this babysitting job. Everything appears normal. Monique and Michelle appear to be a lovely couple, and Jean-Marie feels quite comfortable with the arrangement. So Jean-Marie goes to their house the next day to meet the couple in their home. The meeting starts off fine, but then Michelle asks her if she's a virgin. Jean-Marie is, of course, like, what the hell? This guy's being creepy. She says she has a boyfriend and that she would like to leave. But of course, Michelle was not going to allow that. Beside their new baby in his crib, in their bedroom, Michelle rapes Jean-Marie while Monique watches. Then he strangles her to death. They put her body in the freezer for the time being. I guess they had other things that they had to do that day, like take care of their baby. And then the following day, they bury her on their large property. Jean-Marie is reported missing by friends and family, but apparently she hadn't told anyone where she was going that day, so there were no leads tying her disappearance to Monique and Michelle. And actually, there were other serial killers on the loose in France at that time with the same sort of MO, so police believed that she could be a victim of one of their crimes. A man and a woman with a baby were not even close to being on their radar of potential suspects. And so Michelle and Monique were free to continue on, often moving back and forth between the France and Belgium borders to make things even more complicated. They were about to abduct their youngest victim yet. 
In 1989, Elizabeth Brichet, a 12-year-old Belgian girl with big eyes and beautiful blonde hair, was seen playing with a friend. The couple waited three hours until Elizabeth was finally alone so that they could make their move. This time, Michelle and Monique would use their own child to gain the trust of little Elizabeth. They offered her a ride home, and she likely had no fear for her safety. This was a nice man and his wife and their little baby. They were not what you would think of in terms of the big bad wolf. Instead of driving her home, the couple take Elizabeth back to their house. Michelle instructs Monique to physically examine Elizabeth to ensure she's a virgin. I can't imagine how terrified this little girl must have been and how shocked she would have been to have this happen at the hands of a mother and father. Michelle shows no mercy for this child and he rapes her. And then she is killed and buried on the property as girls before her had been. Her body would not be found for 15 years when the property would finally be searched. 11 months later, the couple would strike again. 13-year-old Natasha Danae is at a supermarket with her mother. She strays away from her mother only momentarily when Monique pulls up in a van to ask her for directions. As Natasha moves closer to the van, Michelle opens the back doors and pulls her in. She is raped and murdered and her body left on a beach. An innocent man was actually charged in Natasha's murder, though of course it wasn't known at the time. Police believed her neighbor had done it, but he was in fact completely innocent. While in jail, this neighbor killed himself. As you know, prison is not a great place for those who hurt children. But unfortunately, police saw this as a sign of guilt, so no other suspects were sought after. Now, I'm uncertain why, but the couple takes a 10-year break from abducting girls. Perhaps they were busy raising their child? I don't know. I don't know. And they've never really said why. But in the year 2000, Michelle says he wants to find another virgin. This time, he goes out by himself. Céline Cesson, an 18-year-old student, is approached by Michelle, who says he is lost and needs directions. She agrees to help, and she actually gets into his vehicle with him to show him the way. Once in the vehicle, he tells her that she needs to have sex with him, or he'll throw acid in her face. He then rapes her and strangles her with a rope, and goes home to Monique to tell her that he had gone hunting and got satisfaction. The couple go through her belongings, including her backpack that had some photos of a recent trip she had taken to America. These are basically trophies that he showed off to Monique, and they both seem to really enjoy reliving the whole experience. Michelle's final victim would be Mananya Thumpong, a 13-year-old girl who disappeared in 2001. Again, he convinces her to get in the vehicle because he's lost, and thinking she's doing the right thing by helping him out, she agrees. Then he takes her into the forest where he rapes and murders her. He goes home to Monique to brag about his conquest, and the pair probably thought at this point they were basically unstoppable. Nobody suspected them, nobody was looking for them, they probably felt like they could get away with anything. But all of that was about to change. The couple go virgin hunting again and spot a 13-year-old girl named Marie that they decide they'd like to take. Michelle walks up to Marie and says he's lost. He asks her to get in the vehicle to give him directions, but Marie says no. Michelle tells, <laughs> here's the funny part. Michelle tells her off for not being trusting enough. Yeah. And then he grabs her and tosses her in the back of the van anyway. They tie her up and start driving off. This little girl pounds on the back door with her feet, kicking and kicking and kicking. She is truly a fighter and a hero because the back door swings open and she rolls out. Thankfully, another vehicle was passing nearby and found this little girl before Michelle and Monique could stop the van and throw her back into the car. Incredibly, she was able to get the license plate. I don't know how she possibly remembered it, but she did. And with the information from the girl and the person who had witnessed her escape, law enforcement officials questioned Michelle and Monique. This was pretty much the beginning of the end for them. 
A search of the couple's vehicle revealed hair from the girl who had escaped from the van. And when law enforcement spoke to Monique, she very quickly turned on her husband. She was afraid of going to prison. So she took this opportunity to throw him under the bus completely. After learning that his wife had agreed to cooperate with police, Michelle kind of knew the gig was up, so he admitted to killing multiple young women and girls. He then helped the authorities recover the bodies of Jean-Marie and Elizabeth Brichet, two of the victims he'd buried on the grounds of his estate. Michelle admitted to kidnapping, raping, and murdering nine girls in a span of 14 years, from 1987 to 2001. He was also accused of 10 additional murders, nine in France and one in Belgium, and was found guilty of seven of these charges. Of course, Monique claimed that she had no desire to help her husband perpetrate his crimes against women and girls. She alleged that Michelle had abused and controlled her to the extent that she felt like she had to cooperate with his demands. But obviously, this was far from the truth. Monique truly enjoyed it. And even after Michelle had broken their initial agreement, you know, the one where he said he would kill her ex-husband in exchange for helping to find the virgins. uh, Guess what? He never did. She still went along with the arrangement. They even role played their crimes in the bedroom. When Michelle assaulted two of his victims, 13-year-old Mananya and 18-year-old Celine, he reportedly forced the teenagers to say, and trust me, you're going to gag at this one, would you make love with me, monsieur, and thank you, monsieur. Monique maintained that she would utter the same phrases to her husband while they were having sex, allowing them both to relive the experience. In May of 2008, after a long and highly publicized trial, Courts convicted Michel Fournier of raping and murdering seven girls and women and sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole. His wife, Monique, received 28 years in prison without the possibility of parole for her complicity in the crimes. 28 years, I mean, she's probably going to die in prison. Now, here's a little interesting tidbit. After Michelle's 1987 release from prison you know, where he initially was arrested, he had over a dozen convictions for sexually assaulting minors, yet he was still able to get a job at a school, which put him in regular close contact with children. Now, there is no evidence that he assaulted any of the students at this school where he worked, thank God, but this revelation came out during his trial and people were freaking out, as they should. Like, how did this guy get a job at a school after after serving time in prison for assaulting minors. Consequently, France created a national sex offender registry to help track people who have been convicted of serious sex crimes. So I guess a little bit of good came out of this at least. That's it for tonight's case. I would like to once again thank tonight's sponsor, Sandra Hilliard, a professional in the field of remote viewing. Make sure you go to her website at sandrahilliard.com for more information and to sign up for a free introductory course that happens on Saturday, October 17th. If you want to reach out, you can find me on Facebook at Serial Napper. You can also search for me on Apple or Spotify. Check me out on Twitter at Serial underscore Napper or I'm on YouTube, Nikki Young, Serial Napper. If you have a chance, I always appreciate reviews on whatever app you're listening to me on. Okay, until next time, don't be a Dahmer. Bye.